in a world where information is plentiful, the scarce resource that we have to manage is, of course, not information. It is attention. It is our capacity to focus on the right things. And then the second point that I would make in terms of imperatives is that if we allow, again, technology to kind of take over our decision-making and the way that we work, there is a risk that we overly quantify everything. That is the imperatives that we have to work with. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means in practice. What sort of organizational models should we be using to actually harness these sort of twin engines of progress? And what sort of people skills do we need to make that work as well? So I want to give you two strategic imperatives that are at the heart of any organization that's going to succeed in this world of rapidly increasing knowledge, greater unpredictability, and greater levels of artificial intelligence. The first is very simple, which is that in a world where information is plentiful, the scarce resource that we have to manage is, of course, not information. It is attention. It is our capacity to focus on the right things. And then the second point that I would make in terms of imperatives is that if we allow, again, technology to kind of take over our decision-making and the way that we work, there is a risk that we overly quantify everything. So that is the imperatives that we have to work with. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means in practice. What sort of organizational models should we be using to actually harness these sort of twin engines of progress? And what sort of people skills do we need to make that work as well? So, let us take the first one first. Let's talk a little bit about new organizing models. My strong advice is that we fight complexity with simplicity. We, particularly people like ourselves, you know, we're, we're heading HR functions, we're heading finance functions, we're heading strategy functions. We love to create order. And when we have order, it makes us feel like we are in control. But the trouble is that order comes at the expense of individual freedom, individual discretion to do things the right way. Bureaucracy. Nothing wrong with bureaucracy, but it's a word that has become tainted because it suggests correctly that we are heavily process-oriented and a little bit slow. Everybody does things according to a role, and that does not allow any innovation. So we need some alternatives to bureaucracy, and I'm going to give you two. The first is what I call meritocracy. Meritocracy arguably beats bureaucracy, particularly in this digital age where knowledge is important. However, meritocracy is also quite slow. It's quite elitist. It has its downsides. Anyone who's ever worked in a, in a professional services firm, a big consultancy or an audit company, will know that meritocracy is a good thing, but it, it drives consensus-based decision-making, which is slow, and it does drive a certain elitism. And so there is a third model, and that third model is called the ad hocracy. This is a term that I think Warren Bennis, the leadership guru, first coined, and I'm trying to bring it back into day-to-day -day use because I think it captures a very important element that the other two miss. Ad hocracy is privileging action. Ad hocracy is defined as an organizing model in which we are putting action ahead of knowledge and ahead of position. So we're not getting rid of knowledge and position, we are simply putting action first. In an ad hocracy, the most important thing you can do is to do something. In other words, to try something out, to experiment, to talk to a customer, to try to move things forward by making stuff happen. Under each of these three structures, we can see a set of specific management practices. And I have to say, I'm not, we don't have time to go through each one of these in turn, but hopefully you'll, you'll see the point that under bureaucracy, we have a number of choices around how we make decisions. We make decisions through a hierarchical basis. We coordinate activities through rules and procedures. People are motivated extrinsically by being paid to do the work that they have been assigned. 
the meritocracy has a different set of practices all around mutual adjustment and working through things through logical argument. We are very big believers in personal mastery in a meritocracy. And as you get into the adhocracy, it's all about opportunity. It's all about moving quickly towards the opportunities that are coming our way. You are HR leaders, you are senior leaders in your organizations. You buy the argument, I hope, that we need a little bit more creativity and stubbornness and innovative thinking among some of our people. How do we get the most out of them? In other words, how do we create an environment in which they can actually thrive? Employees want to be given space. They want to be given clarity on why they're doing something. They want to be given support only when they need it. They want recognition and praise. What do we often end up giving them as bosses? We often end up giving them the exact opposite. We love to be in control. Actually, being a good boss is a very different form of control. It's controlled by essentially trusting that you've got good people working for you who themselves are going to do a good job. So this is really my final point, which is that if we want to make an organization that is fit for the future, that works in particularly around getting the best out of the people around us, we need our leaders to be what I'm going to call ambidextrous. Ambidexterity is being able to draw with both left and right hands. I think there's two very, very different things that we need to be as leaders in order to get that across. First of all, and, and this is the, the story that many of you heard many times, is we have to create that culture in which people feel free and safe to fail. But the key thing is the following, which is as well as doing all of that, we also have to do something dramatically different, which is to be occasionally falling into this sort of decisive mode of work, which says in a period of uncertainty, we need to be decisive. We need to follow this particular opportunity. And for a period, I actually am going to tell you where we are going before I move back into my more uh, empowering style of work. There are different leadership styles, if you want to call it that, under the different organizing models. There's nothing wrong with a classic monitoring and controlling way of working if we're working in a bureaucracy. But as we move to the meritocracy and then to the adhocracy, we need to essentially adapt our leadership style accordingly. And of course, the stuff on the right, the leadership style I'm talking about on the right, is far and away the toughest form of leadership because you've actually got to trust the people around you to do their job. So I'm going to close there. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully this voyage through some of the new organizing models and new people skills was useful. <laughs>